this computer. Okay, good. So um, what I wanted to do today in our part two of our three-part series on the high holidays and preparing for the holidays is actually uh, discuss a, a three prayers from the Rosh Hashanah service just to, to be reminded of the themes of the holiday and then kind of talk about also how they're related to our unique situation today, living in the midst of a pandemic and how we can respond to these themes based on our current reality. So um, let's get right to it. And I wanna share my screen and this way, there we go. So um, you'll see that you can't see everybody now, but um, you, uh, you have a bar of uh, pictures somewhere uh, on your uh, screen and you can, um, I've made it so that I can still see everybody um, because there's one of the um, things to click on makes me able to be able to see six screens at the same time. So um, perhaps if you wanna see more people while I'm talking, you can do that. Um, also unmute yourselves if you have a question to ask me, don't, feel, uh, don't hesitate to just uh, interrupt at any point with a question. Or you could still go down below. Um, no, on, the, on my computer now, if you want to chat, you go to the top of your screen where it says more and just click on chat and you can type in a question that way if you wanted to do that. Um, so, okay, I hope that's not too complicated for you. The easiest thing is unmute yourself and just interrupt and ask a question. Uh, if you wanna do a more, I don't wanna say the more sophisticated, a different way, you can find the chat um, bar and type in a question that way. So I, um, I bought for $6 through the RA website, the um, electronic version, a digital version of our Moxor, uh, figuring that it would come in handy uh, today and next week for the, these classes that I'm uh, facilitating but it might come in handy at other points uh, this high holiday or any other high holiday in the future. Um, I'll try to make this screen a little bit bigger. It's, I'm not sure that you on your screen can make the screen bigger for yourself. You can, you can play with it and try. Um, this you is, can. That's, if you go up to, if you go up next to where it says share screen, it says view options. And it gives you a zoom in there that you can change oh. the, um, 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 as a viewer, you can do uh, that. Oh, oh, as a viewer, you can do that. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. I, I have it on 300%. Okay. <laughs> See, I can't do it any bigger than this. Otherwise, some of the words will disappear off of my screen. But, okay. So the, the, the service on Rosh Hashanah, the morning service, not the preliminary service, but the morning service begins with this word, hamelech, or translated gender neutral in, in this machzor as sovereign. Because Hebrew, let, let me start that way. Hebrew, uh, we should know, if we don't know already, is a, is a gender-based language. So like French, Spanish, Italian, um, Latin uh, nouns are either feminine or masculine. In Hebrew, it's the same way. So if you're, res you can in English refer to a sovereign and you wouldn't know if that sovereign is male or female. In Hebrew, there's no such thing as a gender-free noun. All, um, all nouns in Hebrew are either masculine or feminine, uh, which leads to the idea for the rabbis, well, first in the Torah and then in, by the rabbis, that of course the sovereign would be male, not female. Uh, there, are, there are female images of God and female images of the sovereign that are in the prayer book. We, um, God is referred to as the Shekhinah, the presence. That's a, that's a feminine word. Um, uh, 
we have um, Shabbat Hamalka, the Sabbath queen, um, is uh, one way to refer to Shabbat uh, as the feminine sovereign. Um, so there are feminine words and there are feminine aspects of God that we refer to, but on Rosh Hashanah, we do not. The picture it here is of God as the king. Now, the context for this is, is interesting. So before I talk more about God as king, I do want to look at this in context, and I'm sorry that I have to make it a little bit smaller so we can see the whole page. Um, this, these four lines are, yeah, the end of this prayer, which started two pages before, called Nishmat. It's a prayer, a three-page prayer, that ends the preliminary service on Shabbat and holidays. On a weekday morning, when we have a preliminary service also, we do not have this prayer. On Shabbat or holidays, the service is longer because for the rabbis, we have more time to spend and focus on our prayers. We're not rushed in any other way. We're not distracted by any other kind of things that we have on our agenda or on our schedule for the rest of the day. Shabbat and holidays are days of rest when we can be focused on our relationship to God. And therefore, the service is a little bit longer in order to highlight more of those connections. And the preliminary service kind of helps uh, get us in the mood for the real work of the rest of the service, the morning service and the Musaf service, the additional service on Shabbat and holidays, where we focus on specific religious themes. In the preliminary service, it's more generic, uh, uh, praising God who is the creator of the universe, uh, the creator of the, of the beautiful nature around us, things like that. And this Nishmat prayer, Nishmat, the soul of all that lives, as it's translated here, it highlights that idea that we're thanking God again, kind of summarizing what we've said in the preliminary service, thanking God for creating our soul, the breath of life that God breathed into us. And uh, were, we, um, uh, were we given, um, if, if, and well, I want to say it this way, that we're, we're not able to sufficiently praise God because we're limited as human beings. But if we could, we would praise God as much as possible. So that's, that's the nishmat. And it's, as you see, it's one, two, on to the third page. On Shabbat, the prayer ends, Ram Venisa. So in other words, if this were Shabbat morning, we'd end this prayer by God. Ha'el betatsumot uzecha, ha'gadol b'chvot shemecha, ha'gibor l'anatzach v'anara b'narotecha. Hamelech Yoshev Al Kise Ram Venisa. And that will kind of lead into the cantor or somebody else taking over and starting Shochenad Marom Bekado Shemo. Okay, so on Shabbat you have the music of the service. The specific melody is called the Nusach. That's the Hebrew word for the the, the official melody of the service. And that's the traditional melody for ending nishma, the Nishmat prayer leading into Shochenad. Okay, so on Shabbat, Shacharit officially begins with Shochenad. On a holiday, not Rosh Hashanah, but if it's on Sukkot, Passover, on Shavuot, the service begins here at Ha'el. So the person leading the preliminary service would end it here. Le David Barchinav Shiet Adonai Vachol Kravai Et Shem Kodcho. Then the Shacharit service begins with a special tune on the holiday on Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot. Ha El Betatzumot Uzecha. 
Agadol b'ichvot shemecha. Something like that. I'm not a cantor. I had to know the tunes for all the services in order to graduate rabbinical school. Oh, there are other people waiting to get in. Um, okay. And um, so the, um, I want to get out of that. Okay. Sorry about that. So the, I had to know these tunes and this tune for holidays, it just points out this is what the rabbis did and what uh, the musical service does for us. The music of the service helps us understand what service we're in. The music of the service also helps us understand the theme of the day. All right. So again, on Shabbat, the Shacharit, the morning service officially begins with Shochenad. On a festival that is not Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot, the service starts here with a specific tune for the holiday. But on Rosh Hashanah, it starts here. Here, So there is a special tune for the preliminary service on Rosh Hashanah, which I don't know offhand. That one I can't just start singing for you. Um, and uh, just a second, one more person. And um, so welcome everybody who came in. I, I, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the first prayer that we're taking a look at is HaMelech, the opening of the uh, morning service, the Shachrit service on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. So the, the music helps us understand what service it is. It's, a, it's especially important in a time when, back uh, before the printing press in Jewish history, when most people came to synagogue without a prayer book in their hands and sat at their seat without a prayer book there at the seat. So we take for granted that we have books available that at every, at every seat we open up a prayer book. But we have to understand that back in our history, <clears throat> the only one with a book was the person leading the service. And then not even that person all the time had a book. They, they knew the service by heart. So the idea of responding amen to a prayer uh, was for the rabbis a substitute for saying the prayer itself. If we heard somebody else say the prayer, the person leading the service say the Baruch Atah Adonai phrase, and we said Amen to the end of it, that's as if we said the prayer itself. But the tune of the service also helped people, especially when they didn't have the book in front of them, to remember, oh yeah, this is what today is. The tune today is different than, uh, than it was last week or yesterday. So in other words, you walk into shul on the first day of Passover and you have the, the cantor or the person leading the service begin with that tune. Everybody knows, oh, today's different because that's not the usual tune we do on Shabbat. And we've also kind of divided up the end of the Nishmat prayer a little bit differently to highlight the beginning of the next, the transition to the next service. So Rosh Hashanah has this, and Yom Kippur, has this special beginning to the Shacharit service. Again, ending the Nishmat prayer, but beginning, transitioning to Shacharit with this HaMelech. So again, there are, di there are slightly different ways to do this, but uh, the way I learned it is kind of elongate the Ha, the 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 letter He with that vowel, the straight line vowel, is a prefix that means the. So in, in Hebrew, prepositions are added to the word. They're not a word in and of, it, of themselves. So HaMelech means the king, literally, or in gender-free language, the sovereign. So usually the person leading Shachari will emphasize and elongate and... Um, and, and articulate the ha for a little while before getting to melech to emphasize to the listener, oh yes, this is what it is. So it's kind of like ha, 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 ha melech. Okay, again, I, I've only led, <laughs> sang, 
sang the Rosh Hashanah service once or twice in my life. And I know I'm not, <laughs> I'm not advertising myself as someone who can lead the service. I know the basics, but I was just trying to give you a sense of what a person with a much better voice than I would do uh, traditionally with that word. Okay, so it's emphasizing the ha uh, and, then, and then singing nice and loud the word melech to um, emphasize to everyone this is how, this is what we're focusing on today. We can focus on God in a number of, with a number of images. It could just be Ha'el on a regular festival, okay? It could just be God that we're referring to on a regular festival. It could be Shochein Ad, the one who lives up above that we say on Shabbat, okay? So two, two different images of the God who dwells on high, that's what we refer to on Shabbat when we start the Shacharit service right there. Uh, the um, dwelling for uh, enthroned on high, dwelling forever, exalted and holy is your name. So that's what we start the Shacharit service on, on Shabbat with. On a festival, God, uh, in the fullness of your power. Okay, so we, we focus on that, Alan. What's the God's power to give us the gift of that particular festival? But here on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's specific to God as sovereign, meaning we are God's subjects, okay? God is our, is our king and queen, and we are God's uh, faithful subjects, okay? For, for, the, for the rabbis, in trying to make the infinite God uh, and abstract God, uh, reachable, attainable, understandable, the rabbis added human elements to describe God. And they understood that they were doing so not to limit God in any way, but to help us understand the uh, countless ways in which we can Ex, uh, define God for us. And so th this, even though it seems that we're making God into a human being, um, making God into uh, something that um, is part of this world, it, the rabbis do this only to help us better relate to God and to better understand what aspect of God we should be focusing on today. And by saying that the Shacharit service, the morning service starts with HaMelech, it's emphasizing that the word Melech is gonna be a focus of the prayers on Rosh Hashanah and the days leading up to Yom Kippur. Many, <clears throat> many of the blessings that end with Ha'el are switched to Hamelech. So um, it's going to be distracting if I move ahead really fast to show you an example of that. But, but take my word for it. So, for example, the third prayer of the Amida is uh, the Kedusha, the, the holy, the sanctification prayer. It ends with Ha'el HaKadosh, the holy sacred God. On Rosh Hashanah and the days between Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and on Yom Kippur, instead of saying Ha'el HaKadosh, we say HaMelech HaKadosh. That's just one example of several throughout the Machzor and also the liturgy of the in-between days where the prayer changes from Ha'el to HaMelech. Again, to emphasize that theme of God as sovereign, which implies then that we are God's subjects. Okay, any, um, any questions about that element of God and, um, and what it means for, for us to, is this a, let me, let me ask it this way. Um, by emphasize, well, this, this aspect of God, God as sovereign, is this a meaningful 
um, aspect to you? Do you, can you relate to a God who is sovereign? I, I guess that's the kind of question I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Is this a relatable concept? What is this, what, what, what kind of uh, frame of mind does the prayer put us in when we are referring to God as sovereign? What are we supposed to be thinking about? What kind of, is this a powerful thing? Is it an inspirational kind of way of uh, relating to God? Any, any thoughts about that? So I see, I see it as a negative because I'm sorry about this, but no, 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 don't be, don't apologize. Because you, you know, reflecting on history, yeah, a yeah. lot of these kings did foolish things, and uh, you couldn't do anything about it because you would be killed if or punished if you didn't do it. Right, right. Okay, so there's there's one that one element of uh, what it means to be the subject to a sovereign, and that you're uh, at the at the whim of the sovereign, him or herself. And we know throughout history, uh, throughout the world, that there were benevolent sovereigns, but there were uh, despotic sovereigns, evil, evil people who um, slaughtered, slaughtered their, their subjects, uh, subjected their subjects to starvation um, and other deprivations, taxed them um, to poverty um, so that uh, Jews in history living under a sovereign calling God sovereign might not be such a positive thing. And it could uh, automatically um, uh, say to the people praying, praying the service, hmm, am I what kind of, is this really the kind of God I'm supposed to be praying to? Like the King of Spain that I'm living under, uh, who's just expelled me and I have to get out of town uh, the beginning of uh, the summer of 1492? Is that, or uh, living under this, the, the King who's forcing me to convert to Catholicism? Is this the kind of King that I'm praying to? So Saul has a good point there. And I would, not just from a historical perspective, I would also say, you know, in, in modern times, um, not sure, you know, let, let's just think of God as a parent, which is a, a closer in kind of relationship than uh, king and subject. You have a father-child, mother-child kind of relationship. Uh, a parent also would give orders, give decrees to their child without room for a discussion. But uh, most modern psychologists today encourage parents to be uh, benevolent and compassionate and not be strict. Uh, and so therefore, uh, in the past few decades, when that has become the accepted parenting model, um, seeing God as king uh, makes it that much harder because we're we're, we're not used to accepting orders from our parents. We're, we're used to having a discussion with our parents about this and our parents being nice to us and, kind, uh, and letting things slide, that kind of thing. And so uh, referring to God as king or queen might be a, a very foreign kind of idea. Um, and another thing I would say about this is that we also today spiritually like to, I imagine, like to think as God being accessible, approachable, that, there, that, that God can be easily found and easily accessed. And having the picture of God as king or queen uh, implies that it's not so easy to access God right? Unless, unless you're part of the heavenly court, unless you're part of the, of the court of the modern day king or queen, it's kind of hard to get access unless you're invited by the king or queen to have access, right? So, so with this idea too, here we are, we're begging God to have access 
We're begging God to deign to even listen to us for just a moment. Okay, so I think that all these elements here are part of what the rabbis are trying to instill upon us. That, you know, they're, um, that our, our spirituality should be difficult. It, should be, um, it shouldn't be too difficult that we're, it's not worth trying, but it shouldn't be so easy either, the rabbis are saying. And that it's a process that is worth fighting for. It's worth trying to um, change ourselves in some way in order to have access to God. So I think these are things that we can think about uh, when, we, when the rabbis say that, especially on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we're referring to God as sovereign of the universe. So any other thoughts or questions or comments about this? Betsy, unmute yourself. Yeah. And we go. Betsy, okay, um, good. When I think of king in this sense, yeah. it, it's not the image that I like because I think of God is sitting on a throne in judgment. Uh huh. You know, that, that that whole idea of the judgment, which right, isn't which is the where kind we're of getting God to that. being That's approachable that you were talking right. about. Yes. Right. So, uh, right. So it's it's hard to approach God in that way. That's yeah. Right. Uh, yes. So let me. Uh, but Howard, did you have a a question? I just my observation would be that thinking of God as sovereign gives a personification in a spiritual sense of something for which you can ask forgiveness from uh -huh. as opposed to some ethereal entity called God, the visualization of someone who is a judge in some respects um, is there as a presence. Huh? Right. Right. So, uh, which also leads into this next prayer I want to look at. Okay. So yes. Yeah. So what are the, the other, the other image of God on the, on the holidays is, um, especially on Rosh Hashanah, because Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment. It's the beginning of this 10-day period in which God is sitting on the throne as sovereign, but judging us on this day as to whether we're going to be written by God into the book of life or into the book of death. And we'll, we'll get on that, we'll get to that idea in the third prayer, um, but I wanna look at this, at this prayer here. So this is in the morning service, which we are not going to be doing this year on Zoom, as I explained last week, the preliminary service and this morning service, you, you're on your own, we're all on our own to pray by ourselves. Uh, we will be together on Zoom for the uh, very, very conclusion of the Torah service, that the prayers for country, Israel, and peace. On Sunday, it'll be the shofar service. On Shabbat, then it'll be my sermon, followed by the cantor uh, singing Musaf. So that, that's what our service is going to be together. So we're going to be missing one of, the, one of the key prayers of the morning service is this, which is done when the Amida is repeated out loud. Okay, so it's not done when we read the Amida silently to ourselves, it's done when we say the prayer out loud. So it's one of these prayers that, is, uh, that introduces the, um, the Kedusha, which is on the next page. So um, let's see, there we go. Uh, so here, we, here it is, this, this prayer is written um, in, uh, as you can see, if you can, uh, in, this, in the commentary, it explains that this is written by one of these, um, in Hebrew, the, the term is a payatan, a person who writes a piyut in Hebrew, which is a religious hymn, H-Y-M-N. So a, a payatan is a hymnist, and uh, I guess uh, the the hymnists write a hymn that is collected into a hymnal. Um, and so this was one of the earliest ones in Jewish history, Elazar Khalir, if 
from Israel from the 500s. So this is a 1500 year old prayer and it's, um, it has a very, uh, uh, the traditional tune for this would be Le'el Orechdin Levochein Levavot Beyom Din Legole Amukot Badin. So it has, just when I sing this tune, it might not have the same effect on you. I, it, it, it is one of the key tunes of the High Holidays. It's, it reminds me that it is Rosh Hashanah. And I kind of get chills when uh, just by singing it, again, apologies for my voice, but that's a traditional melody uh, for this hymn, which is both on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that it's done in the morning service. And what are we saying? We are saying, and so let um, the ultimate arbiter of justice, right? lacha hakol yachtiru. So let, a, let all crown you sovereign the ultimate arbiter of justice, okay? So in other words, God is judge, the ultimate judge, who probes all hearts on the day of judgment and reveals what is hidden with justice, who is the voice of truth on the day of judgment and pronounces rules of justice, who is wise and acts lovingly on the day of judgment and remembers the covenant while dispensing justice, who has compassion for all creation on the day of judgment and purifies the faithful with justice. Don't need to read the rest of it, read rest of the prayer, but it's a similar theme that we're referring to God as judge, but judge not in the totally black and white, totally objective, totally judging on evidence alone, but we are beseeching the judge for mercy and compassion and that judges depending upon the jurisdiction in america and depending upon the nature of the crime are allowed to be creative in dispensing judgment so if human judges are allowed to do that how much more so we uh, in our prayer book and the rabbis suggest that god is willing to dispense justice with mercy and compassion. So for the rabbis, there are two sides to God and actually two thrones that God sits on. God sits on the throne of justice and God sits on the throne of mercy. And so on the high holidays, by referring to God as judge, what we're really doing according to the rabbis is trying to convince God to move off of God's throne of justice <clears throat> and sit on God's throne of mercy. Because if God only dispensed justice objectively without compassion and mercy based solely on the evidence, <clears throat> then according to the rabbis, we all would be judged negatively. And so instead we recognize because we are flawed human beings, because we do not um, possibly uh, participate in teshuva, in repentance, in a sincere, wholehearted way. And also, even if we did, we might not be able to be consistent uh, with this new behavior and carry it forward beyond, let's say, the holiday of Sukkot, which is only five days after Yom Kippur. So the rabbis recognize that it's kind of hard to maintain a righteous kind of attitude and personality. And so we uh, give in to the God of justice, Le'el Orechdin, and pray uh, fervently that God will be kind to us and uh, compassionate to us. So this is, this is an example of uh, many such prayers that refer to God as judge and with the understanding that it is the God of uh, justice dispensed with mercy. So um, any thoughts or comments about this one? So what I, what I wanna spend the rest of the time on, and I wish the, uh, wait a second, I'm going to, Let's see if that will work. 
I'm trying to go to 792. Uh, no, oh, six, I'm sorry, going the other way, 644. There we go. Okay, so um, during the Musaf service, which we will do this year, and this is the, this, uh, there is this uh, very important prayer uh, before the Kedusha. The Kedusha comes here two pages later. Uh, and this prayer comes, you know, right after the beginning of the service. Atagibur leolam Adonai mechayei metim ata rav lehoshia, right in the high holiday melody. And then you get to this prayer where the ark is opened, and it's unatana tokef, the sacred power of the day. Okay, so this prayer has this paragraph in it. It's a, very, it's a very powerful prayer. It's written uh, in the Middle Ages, in a time of the Crusades. Um, and there's a lengthy story about the, the legend that's behind the writing of this. But the, uh, the feature of this is the Rosh Hashanah Yikatevun. On Rosh Hashanah it is written, the Yom Tzom Kippur Yechatevun. And on the uh, day of Yom Kippur, the fast day of Yom Kippur, it is sealed, right? Um, and what is kama yavrun v'chama yibarun? How many will pass on, and how many will be born? Right? Who's going to live? Who's going to die? Mi yichye mi yamut. Who will live? Who will die? Mi bekitzo umilo bekitzo. Who at their time when they are supposed to die at 120, and who dies? Who will die before their 120? Mi baesh umi bamaim. Who's going to die by fire? Who's going to die by water? Mi bacherev, mi bachaya, who will die by the sword, who will die by a wild animal. Mi b'ra'av, mi b'tzama, who by um, famine, who by thirst. Mi b'ra'ash, who by an earthquake. Umi b'magefa, who will die by a plague. So, uh, and then it goes on, chanika, sekila, who by strangulation, by stoning, Mi anuach, mi anuach, who will be at rest, who will be agitated. Mi ashkit, mi trof, who will be at peace, who will be troubled, etc. Who mi yushpal, mi arum, who will be brought down, who will be, who will rise up. The Rosh Hashanah yikatevun, uviyom tzom kimpur yechatevun. Okay, so for the author of this, of this hymn, and the author, and for the author of other hymns and other prayers throughout the Mahsur over the centuries, you have this idea that God is, uh, intervenes in our life, is active in the world around us, uh, is the mover of historic of events uh, in history, uh, and therefore God, this uh, uh, hurricane, Hurricane Laura two weeks ago in in North in uh, Louisiana, volcano in Indonesia erupting or in Central America, or the plague, the COVID nineteen plague, uh, according to uh, our tradition, God is causing this pandemic to rage around us, and we, in this prayer, admit that that is what God does, but that we can, with our free will, uh, kind of affect what's going to happen to us. If we have appropriate teshuva, we kind of can force God to go off script. So our prayer and the performance of mitzvot are our opportunities to ad lib, traditionally speaking, the script that God already has in front of God. So by ad-libbing, that is um, doing things that we're supposed to do, but then with our own free will, doing them better than we could, doing them with teshuva, with repentance, then we, are, we could convince God to go off script and not bring any one of these dire punishments 
on us. And that even though the plague is raging around us, according to this prayer, we could overcome that. How? With the very next line, Uteshuva, Utefila, Utsedaka. I'm doing it in kind of like the Ashkenazi way. Uteshuva, Utefila, Utsedaka, repentance, prayer, and acts of justice, not just giving money to charity, which you could translate Sadaka, but rather Sadaka is justice. Ma'avirin et roa hagazera. How is it translated here? Uh, to, they have the power to transform the harshness of our destiny. Okay, well, that takes away the harshness of the decree. Okay, the gezera is decree. So in other words, the decree is there. All we ha can do is alleviate how harsh the decree will be. And that either will be that we won't be punished that way, or we can withstand the punishment better. It's the same punishment, but if we have teshuvat bilan tzedakah, then we have the resources available to withstand whatever punishment we um, feel like are coming to us from God. So this prayer is a very powerful statement about theology. It's a powerful statement about why good and evil happen in the world. It's a powerful statement about what we can do as Jews to deal with the chaos and the evil of the world around us. And this is just the, the traditional perspective on how we can deal with, um, with the harshness of the world. And, that's, and that, this essentially is what Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is about. That because the new year is starting, it's starting, it's another opportunity for us to begin anew. Uh, we, we recognize God is sovereign of the universe. God is the ultimate judge and God, and uh, we have some role in the, in the world to play to, with teshuvah, tefillah, and staka, repentance, prayer, and acts of justice to transform the world around us. It's a new year, new beginning, new start, and let's begin proactively. Let's assert to God that we are willing and able to do this and hopefully with fervent, um, sincere prayer, then we will be rewarded and blessed. Any thoughts or comments about this prayer? I've, I've spoken about it many times, but any uh, over the years, uh, but any, any thoughts or comments you have about it? Rabbi? Yes, Sherry. Well, I have a problem with it because yeah. it doesn't respond to why the, a pious young person Who's done right. they, they still could die young. Right. That's exactly right. And there's bad no answer. People. Go ahead. Bad, you know, still bad things happen to very good people. Oh, absolutely. Right. So the Holocaust. The right. Now, right. So Sherry, you're absolutely right. And there's no, there's no 100% answer that would satisfy us 100% of the time. Because if there was then we'd all be that religion because that would be the answer and that's the one that would work in the most trying of times. So all we have are options to think about that might provide some comfort as we're dealing with a very harsh punish, uh, what would be considered a harsh punishment or crisis to go through. So there's no way to answer why six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. There's no way to answer why a child dies of some incurable genetic disease. There's just no way, there's no way to answer that question. Because for the rabbis, the only way to answer that question, now it's one thing to answer why someone might die before 120, okay? Or let's say 70. For the rabbis, they realized 
uh, not too many people they knew lived to 120. They said King David, they said, lived to the age of 70. So that's a full life. So if you die before 70, then the, as an adult, let's say you're 68 and you pass away, for the rabbis, well, you had two years worth of evil that you did or transgressions that you performed, uh, which, which uh, knocked off some time from the full 70 years that you should have had. So, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but it's one way for the rabbis to explain, okay, why a 68-year-old person died and he didn't reach 70. And anything over 70 is like extra. You're starting over, which is why a second bar mitzvah would be at 83. So it's one thing to explain it away that way, and people might be able to understand that because people can say, you know, when I, when I have to admit it, I, I have to recognize I'm not a perfect person. So you can understand that this theology of God intervening in that way, but you can't understand why a five-year-old would die or why someone would be murdered in the Holocaust. So there you're left by the traditional theology of saying that uh, God, who are we who live on earth for 70 years to question the eternal infinite God? God knows the infinite plan of the universe, and God knew that the six million fit into that plan some way. And even though it's 75 years after the end of World War II, we still can't come to grips with why the Holocaust would have happened. Okay, it's not for us to question. That's one way. That's one way to, that the rabbis understand when they, when they are faced with not having an answer, the only answer is we just have to accept it. The other answer is that righteous people are able to withstand the punishment more than evil people are. In other words, it doesn't take much for a bad person to stay away from God. So do something little to a bad person who might, maybe you might be able to convince to come back into the fold. One little thing happens, forget it, I'm out. That according to the rabbis. So you can't punish an evil person but you can punish a righteous person because a righteous person is going to stick with God no matter what. And there are, there is this concept of Yisurin Shalahava, love torture, it's called, and that the righteous people are uh, blessed, according to this theology, uh, this traditional approach, are blessed by being tested by God in this way. But then the Holocaust does is its own um, its own entity that does not fit into this at all. So, you know, so uh, so these are just the traditional ways of trying to understand the ways of the world around us and God's role in the ways of the world. There are other modern Jewish approaches to this and explanations of this, which are which relate to this, this phrase that teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah have a power to oh, transform the harshness of our destiny. The idea that, you know, God, we, we view these events happening around us. These events happen. How do we understand these events? And I'm going to be talking about this on the second day of Rosh Hashanah in my talks. So I don't want to give too much away, but I've talked a little bit about this before over the years, is God actively involved in the universe? Do we have to believe that? Or is God out there and our job is to find God? All right, so if we, if we see Jewishly that God is out there and our job is to find God, then out, the way to find God is through this mess of the, um, the fire, the water, the sword, the wild animal, the famine, the thirst, the earthquake, and the plague. These things are happening around us. We have to navigate our way around them, and our tools for navigation are teshuvah, tefillah, and tzedakah. These, if we, if we have those tools in our backpack, but even more than our backpack, it's not something you sling over your shoulder to help you through, 
but it, actually it's instilled within you, then, um, um, then, how, then um, if it's within us, then, um, then we can uh, navigate. And I'm sorry, I was hesitating there because there's a, a question here. Um, so that was asked, uh, how is God going to deal with the holidays this year? So, um, well, you know, it's more than how are people going to deal with the holidays this year? Uh, I think that's how I, I would ask the question. And, you know, so I've been, I've been studying, um, I've been studying for the past 26 years with my friend, Rabbi Ethan Seidel, who just retired from Tiferet Israel on 16th Street. And we just started studying um, the um, commentary to the Torah readings by a rabbi from Poland who lived during the Holocaust, who um, wrote these sermons that he gave to his community in the ghetto. So, I mean, can you imagine, imagine observing Shabbat uh, when it's impossible to do so, when you are under strict surveillance by the Nazis, that you can't do anything publicly, Jewishly, uh, uh, under the eye of the Nazis. And this is just in the ghetto, let alone in the concentration camp. So um, imagine the words that he was saying to, to his faithful, to, to who are living through these plagues. The sword, the wild animal, the, the, uh, all this evil, the famine, starvation, that's there in, in, um, imposed by the Nazis on the Jews. So they are living through these punishments, yet he, this rabbi, had to try to convince his flock to stay faithful to God, that this is all, this is happening now, but there will come a day that we will have salvation. So I, I don't know if it was effective. I mean, that rabbi was killed uh, by the Nazis. Uh, but you know, but we hear stories. There's, a, there's another book that's uh, called a Hasidic Anthology of the Holocaust, uh, something like that. By, uh, if you Google it, the, uh, the editor of it is a uh, Professor Yaffa Eliach, E-L-I-A-C-H. And she collected these uh, stories that were um, uh, associated with rabbis who were in the concentration camps and the words they shared and also the deeds that they performed that were extraordinary. So, so take a look at that book. It's like a, the, a Hasidic anthology of the Holocaust, something like that. But if you just look at the author Eliach, E-L-I-A-C-H, uh, you'll, you'll see this. And then, the, and then the, what I'm studying with Rabbi Seidel is called the Aish Ish Kodesh, the Holy Fire, uh, by this uh, this uh, rabbi. I forget his last name uh, now, but uh, it's incredible the faith that people have. So, faith sees you through, but also the resources that you have: community, family, um, the uh, strength, uh, emotional strength, um, and um, fortitude. Uh, all help you help people withstand uh, whatever life brings them. So um, I, that's, and again, that doesn't answer your question either, Sherry, because, you know, why should someone with emotional fortitude be able to withstand this and somebody who doesn't have that not be able to withstand it? It's not their fault that they don't have the emotional strength to handle it they're still uh, living through this crisis. So, you know, it's, um, they're, they're, uh, for me, the answer to this question determines how I understand God. Um, um, and that, right, my, the purpose of religion for me is to be able to help me navigate through life, as opposed to coming up with an idea of what God is, and then hoping that that idea of God can help me navigate through life, right? So the idea for the rabbis is that God is king, sovereign of the universe, and active in life today. Well, if that's the case, well, we just have to deal with the consequences 
of that these things are happening and they happen by God. But on the other hand, if we come up with an idea of God, that God is one who helps us navigate through, then you get to an understanding of what God is. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And that doesn't mean if we come up with my way of doing it, which isn't my way, it's like other modern Jewish thinkers who came before me, they come up with that way of understanding what religion is, that God comes at the end of the journey of figuring out your way to faith, uh, that's still a Jewish way of understanding it. It's not the traditional Jewish way, but it is still a Jewish way of understanding God and understanding the way of the world around us. So that's what the High Holiday Liturgy does for us. And if it's challenging, then so be it. But it's challenging in a way that shouldn't make us close the moxer and say, this, this doesn't have anything to do with me. Rather, it should be challenging in a way, okay, how can I understand this in a way that makes sense to me? It's a way, in a way that is spiritually relevant to me. So we'll, we'll continue the discussion next Tuesday when we uh, look at some of the prayers for Yom Kippur. So have a good rest of the day, everybody. And I hope everybody stays safe and healthy. And um, I will see you all. What's the next thing? Tomorrow is Wednesday. So 11 o'clock, we have Torah study. And uh, 7.30 is evening minion tomorrow. Have a good rest of the day. Bye, all. Bye-bye.